Income tax 2023-2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Rental property, which has personal use where we're trying to determine if the dwelling unit is used as a home and then reporting income and deductions. Get ready and some coffee so we can lessen the sting of the IRS smack with income tax. Preparation 2023-2024. Most of this information can be found in Publication 527, Residential Rental Property, including Rental of Vacation Homes Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. The Rental Income Schedule E, ultimately rolling into line one, Income of the Income Tax Formula. Remembering the first half of the income tax formula is basically that funny income statement where we have income minus instead of expenses, we call them deductions resulting in instead of net income, we call it taxable income. We note that the Schedule E rental income like the Schedule C business income is in essence an income statement in and of itself having rental income minus rental expenses, which you could call rental deductions, resulting in, in essence, net rental income rolling in from the Schedule E to line one income of the income tax formula. This income tax formula basically outlining the calculation of the Form 1040, of which we see the first page here, the income section, Schedule E ultimately rolling into line number eight, additional income from Schedule 1. This is the Schedule 1, additional income and adjustments to income part number one, additional income, Schedule E rolling into line five, rental real estate from the Schedule E. This is the Schedule E, supplemental income and loss, basically an income statement breaking out the income by property in essence. So now we're always being comparing. We're comparing back these situations here. We're a bit more complex where we have a mixture of personal and business in terms of the rental property uses to the pure case where the rental property is used exclusively for rental property. So just like in a bookkeeping system with our tax situation, we would like it if we can separate everything, just like a child saying, I don't like my mashed potatoes mixed together with the peas because then it messes everything up and it all tastes funny. So you have to separate it similarly with the bookkeeping here. So we have to, if we have the rental property compared to the base case where the rental property is just rental property, then we deal with the income and expenses applied to the rental property as opposed to the personal property, more likely than the ordinary and necessary expenses to run the rental property will be deductible on the Schedule E. Then we have situations where we mix things together and we just have to deal with it. That's where the peas are at. They're in the mashed potatoes. Deal with it. You're going to have to separate it yourself. Even though you're going to get some of the mashed potatoes stuck on the peas, you got to do your best to separate it now that it's already mixed together. So then what you end up doing is saying, well, that could happen if you have like your own home and then you rent like a room within the home. And so now you have to break out the expenses between business and personal. But now we're thinking more typically of a situation where we have a vacation home. And then the question is, do we have personal use of the vacation home? If so, how do we break out the expenses? And we're specifically looking at this, this question of, is it categorized as a home? Because if it is, we might have more uh, restrictions on the losses and that also could have an impact as to whether we can deduct the mortgage interest and the 
uh, property taxes. The other question is, can we deduct some of those possibly as a second home on the Schedule A itemized deduction for the personal side of things? So those are some of the questions that come up with the rental property. So remember, if you had the second unit and it was just rental, that would be a lot easier than the vacation home situation where now we have all these questions that we're going to be diving into in more detail here. One more note, remember that the income side of things is usually fairly straightforward. If someone pays you for the rental property, it's gonna be rental income you would expect because they're not gonna pay you for the personal use of the property, not for your personal use of the property, right? It's the expenses that become a problem because we want the expenses as a deduction. Those are the things we're trying to get and the things the IRS is gonna to try to restrict us on based on these rules. All right, so dwelling unit used as a home. What does that even mean, man? Well, if you use a dwelling unit for both rental and personal purposes, the tax treatment of the rental expenses you figure earlier under uh, dividing expenses and rental income depends, and we talked about that last time, it depends on whether you are considered to be using the dwelling unit as a home. So you use a dwelling unit as a home during the tax year if you use it for personal purposes uh, more than the greater of. So here's the rule, the arbitrary rule. 14 days or not an and uh, or 10 percent of the total days it is rented to others at a fair rental price now this gets complicated because we're not saying like 10 percent of the year like on a 365 basis we have to figure out how much time we've rented it to other people just like we did when we were trying to find the ratio to break out the expenses between business and personal which we get, again, didn't use like 365 the whole year, but instead had to kind of figure out the business and personal actual uh, usage. Okay, so if a dwelling unit is used for personal purposes on a day it is rented at a fair rental price discussed earlier, so you're renting it, you're renting it at a fair rental price, but you're actually using it still, we have the two kind of kind of calculations on that. One for the expense calculation, do we qualify as a business uh, for the allocation of the expenses? And the other for the calculation of does it qualify as like a home, which are two different kind of rules where that implication could find itself causing us problems. So in that case, don't count that day as a day of rental use in applying two above. Instead, count as a day for personal use in applying both one and two above. So, so let's, we're going to see an example, I think, shortly on this. But in any case, what is a day of personal use then? A day of personal use of a dwelling unit is any day that the unit is used by any of the following persons. Now, of course, you might say, obviously, if you're hanging out in your rental property, then you would think clearly that would be a personal day. But what if like you have family members hanging in the personal property? Or you might argue, I'm not hanging in the personal property, man. I'm working on it. I know I'm sitting here with a with a cocktail on the in the hammock, but I'm you know, right? So then you have the question of are you working on the property or are you just hanging out in the property for vacation purposes? So you are uh, any other person who owns an interest in it unless uh, unless you rent it to another owner uh, as their main home under a shared equity finance agreement defined later. However, see days used as a main home before uh, or after renting later. So a member of your family or a member of the family of any other person who owns an interest in it. So now you've got your family members hanging out there. That's going to qualify for these days to think of it as a home and so on. Unless the family member uses the dwelling unit as their main home and pays a fair rental price. So now you're saying, hey, wait a second, I'm renting it to the family member. Well, did you charge a fair rental price and is it their main home? Then obviously you have to be very careful with related people in terms of reporting these things to the IRS because they're gonna say it's not an arm's length transaction. You're gonna have to prove and verify that you're renting it at the fair market price and so on. Family includes only, uh, family includes only your spouse, siblings, half siblings, ancestors, parents, grandparents, etc., and lineal descendants, children, uh, grandchildren, etc. So anyone under an arrangement that lets you use some other dwelling unit, so they're, you know, an exchange kind of situation, any, 
anyone at less than fair rental price. So the assumption here, of course, being if you're renting it to someone at something under the fair rental price, it seems like it's kind of personal property that you're letting you know, someone hang out that's a friend or something like that. So main home. So if the other person or member of the family in one or two has more than one home, their main home uh, are ordinarily the one they lived in most of the time. So if they have two homes, question then is which one do they live in more in terms of the qualification for that categorization of main home. Shared equity financing agreement. This is an agreement under which two or more persons acquire uh, undivided interest for more than 50 years in an entire dwelling unit, including the land and one or more of the co-owners are entitled to occupy the unit as their main home upon paying of the rent to the other owner owners. Donation of use of the property. So you use a dwelling unit for personal purposes if you donate the use of the unit to a charitable organization. So now you have a donation type of situation. If you are donating it, then from a deduction standpoint, you might be thinking, okay, can I deduct that on maybe like a Schedule A charitable type of deductions? And if you if you get a benefit from it, from deducting it as a charitable type of deduction, you would think that you're, you know, you're using it kind of for personal use and then giving it away as part of your personal use for charitable kind of deductions. You would think you wouldn't get a double benefit of using it that way and getting a deduction possibly for charitable usage as well as rental property deductions, right? So the organization sells sells the use of the unit at a fundraising event and uh, the purchaser uses the unit, okay? Example, let's take a look at an example. That's So you and your neighbor are co-owners of a condominium at the beach. It's a nice place. It's a nice place. I've been there. It's it's beautiful. So last year you rented the unit to vacationers whenever possible. This is, I haven't really been there by the way. I'm just joking. So the unit wasn't used as a main home by anyone. Your neighbor uh, used the unit for two weeks last year. Uh, You didn't use it at all. Because your neighbor has an interest in the unit, both of you are considered to have used the unit for personal purposes during those two weeks. Example number two, you and your neighbors are co-owners of a house under a shared equity financing agreement. So there's, this is that kind of strain, little bit unusual of a one, kind of that exception case, which of course we need an example on because it's that strange kind of exception case, but that might not come up so often. Obviously, most of these cases are possibly more likely to come up in more well-off individuals who have, you know, vacation homes and multiple properties. And are, if that was the case, if you have vacation homes and multiple properties, you're probably looking for, for ways that you can you can share it with other people and whatnot. So you end up with these kind of weird situations that you have to <laughs> account for for taxes. So your neighbors live in the house and pay you a fair rental price. So even though your neighbors have an interest in the house, the days your neighbors live there aren't counted as days of personal use by you. This is because your neighbors rent the house as their main home under a shared equity financing agreement. All right, example number three, you own a rental property that you rent to your son. So now we get this weird situation, which again happens all the time. If you're in a more well-off situation and you have multiple properties and whatnot, then you might rent it to people that are related to you, which could cause problems from an IRS perspective because it's not an arm's length transaction. Therefore, we can't depend on the market to tell us that it's a arm's length transaction at a market price, which distorts the whole kind of system. So your do- your son doesn't own any interest in the property. So he's just hanging there. He's kind of a deadbeat, but you know, hopefully he'll come, he'll, he'll wake up out of it at some point. We have hope for the kid, you know, but he used it as, as his home, as his main home and pays you a fair rental price. So your son, your son's use of the property isn't personal use by you because your son is using it as his main home. So he owns no interest in the property and he is paying you a fair rental price. So obviously getting to that fair rental price, we discussed a little bit before, might be comparable prices doing some kind of an appraisal 
similar to like if you were selling the home, for example, looking at the rental prices of, of units around you, which you want to do, because if you got audited by the IRS, you'd probably be asked that question and have to say, this is how I came up with the fair rental price. Example four. So you rent your beach house to Rosa. Rosa's a nice lady. We've, been, we've known Rosa for a long time. Rosa rents her cabin uh, in the mountains to you. So you got this exchange thing happening. So you, so Rose, so this is again, fairly common. You would think with higher income individuals at home, they own different properties. Like, yeah, you can use my vacation cabin and I'll exchange that for use of uh, your beach house. And you're like, well, that's cool. I've been exchanging with other well-off individuals and it's been a, a uh, beneficial endeavor to me. So uh, yeah, let's do that, Rosa. So you each pay a fair rental price. So, so you are using your beach house for personal purposes on the days that Rosa uses it because your house is used by Rosa under an arrangement that allows you to use her cabin. So notice that situation is a little bit of a tricky situation. You got this kind of exchange quid quo pro situation going on. And, and so they're still going to qualify for the personal use. Example number five. So you rent your apartment to your mother at less than a fair uh, rental price. I don't usually do that. You know, I, business is business, man. But, you know, she's my mom. So I was like, okay she can't pay the rent i tried i threatened to break her thumbs if she didn't pay just kidding but and it still didn't work so i have to rent it to her for less than a fair so whatever anyways it is what it is so you are using the apartment for personal purposes on the days that your mother rents it because uh you rent it for less than the fair rental price so come on mom you're messing up the whole thing now the iris is gonna mess up my whole whether it's going to be rental property or not calculation. Oh, anyway, days used for repairs and maintenance. So any day that you spent working substantially full-time repairing and maintaining, not improving your property, isn't counting as a day of personal use. So obviously you're saying, hey, Iris, yeah, it looks like I was hanging out in the hammock, drinking a cocktail, but I was working on the property, okay? It was not vacation time. It was work time. It was work time. So you're going to have, that's the argument. So you, so don't count such days, such a day as a day of personal use, even if family members use the property for recreational purposes. So you might say, IRS, I know you've got pictures that look like it's me in that hammock drinking a cocktail, but it's not. Those are my lazy family members who came over, said they were going to help me, but they didn't. Okay, I was working. I was dredging the gunk out of the gutters and, and the drainages on the houses, cutting trees down so they don't fall on the, the living room or something. Anyway, example. So Corey owns a cabin in the mountains that he rents for most of the year. He spends a week at the cabin with family members. So Corey works on maintenance of the cabin three or four hours each day. And it was grueling work. This, this, this is like I was working, man, four hours, three to four during the week and spends the rest of the time fishing, hiking, and relaxing. So Corey's family members, however, work substantially, work substantially full time on the cabin each day during the week. They worked a lot. Okay, the main purpose of, of being at the cabin that week is to do maintenance work. Therefore, the use of the cabin during the week by Corey and his family won't be considered personal use by Corey. So it's kind of a shade, kind of a gray area in terms of does it qualify for work or maintenance or not? You know, you have to clock, you know, who's clocking in the hours on that, but you know, you can get the con the idea makes sense. So days used as a main home before or after renting. So for purposes of determining whether a dwelling unit was used as a home, you may not have to count days you used the property as your main home before or after renting it or offering it for rent as days of personal use. So in other words, you're saying, okay, wait a sec. I didn't really start renting it till like the middle of the year. So does it count to those days that it was personal use before I kind of made it like rental and vacation home count 
towards the day's use situation. So don't count them as days of personal use if. So you rented or tried to rent the property for 12 or more consecutive months or you counted or tried to rent the property for a period of less than 12 consecutive months and the period ended because you sold or exchanged the property. However, this special rule doesn't apply when dividing expenses between rental and personal use. You can see property changed to rental use in chapter four, which we discussed earlier. Example. So on February 28th, 2022, you moved out of a house uh, you have lived in for six years. It was a tough move. I like that place. How? Because you accepted a job in another town. You got to do what you got to do. They paid me a lot more. So you rented your house at fair rental price from March 15th, 2022 to May 14th, 2023, 14 months. So on June 1st, 2023, you moved back into your old house. So the days you use the house as your main home from January 1st to February 28th, 2022, and from June 1st to December 31st, 2023, aren't counted as days of personal use. Therefore, uh, you would use the rules in chapter one when figuring your rental income and expenses. Let's take a look at example number two here. On January 31st, you moved out of the condominium uh, you had lived in for three years. So it was supposed to, so you offered it for rent at a fair rental price beginning February 1st. You were unable to rent it until April. On September 15th, uh, you sold the condominium. So the days you used the condominium as your main home from January 1st to January 31st aren't counted as days of personal use when determining whether you used it as a home. Example one, you converted the basement of your home into an apartment with a bedroom, a bathroom, and a small kitchen. So now it's not just a basement, it's a full living area because it's got all the things to be a dwelling, which are you can sleep in it, you can bathe in it, you can go to the bathroom in it, and you've got a kitchen. So you rented the basement apartment at a fair rental price to college students during the regular school year. So the college students don't mind that they're living in the dark dungeon because they're college students. So you rent it to them uh, on a nine month lease, 273 days. You figure 10% of the total days rented to others at a fair rental price is 27 days. So during June, th June 30 days, your brothers stayed with you and lived in the basement apartment rent free. Those bums. I don't even, I didn't want him to come over, but the wife was like, you have to be nice. And I was like, whatever, dude. Oh, I should have just, I should have kicked him out. Anyways, now, now I got to deal with the tax results of this. So your basement apartment was used as a home because you used it for personal purposes for 30 days. See, I, that guy, rent free used by your brother is considered personal use. Your personal use 30 days is more than the greater of 14 days or 10% of the total days it was rented. That guy costed me money all the time. I'll tell you what. Anyways, example number two. You rented the guest room in your home at a fair rental price during the, the local college's homecoming commencement and football weekends. Ooh, I'm going to get some good rent on that one because those there's not many places during that time of year so you can charge like a lot of money these crazy kids and their families so your sister-in-law stayed in the room rent free ah oh, dude i could have rented that out for a lot of money right there okay whatever another one of these sister-in-law came over so rent free for at least uh three weeks 21 days in july so you f you think oh that was in july so you figure 10 percent of the total days rented to others so at least it wasn't my brother so that's, I can deal with her more. So you figure 10% of the total days rented to others at a fair rental price is three days. So the room was used as a home because you used it for personal purposes for 21 days. Uh, that is more than the greater of 14 days or 10% of the 27 days it was rented. Okay, example number three. You own a condominium this time apartment in a resort area it's a nice resort area 
What kind of resort? We skiing here? We doing biking or something? You rented it at fair rental price for a total of 170 days during the year. So for 12 of these days, the tenant wasn't able to use the apartment and allowed you to use it, even though you didn't refund the rent. So now you're using it, but you still charged them the rent uh, for it. So your family actually used the apartment for 10 of those days. Therefore, the apartment is treated as having been rented for 160 days and uh, that's that's the 170 days so you've got the revenue now notice this rule might differ in terms of the breaking out between the expenses between personal and rental and this calculation with regards to whether it's a home the home or not so therefore the apartment is treated as having been rented for 160 which is the 170 minus 10 days you figure 10 percent of the total days rented to others at a fair rental price is 16 days right 16 days okay and your family also used the apartment for seven other days during the year so you used the apartment as a home because you used it for personal purposes for 17 days that is more than the greater of 14 days or 10 percent of the 160 days it was rented all right minimal usage rule so now you've got this kind of like, it's the de minimis rule. You know, what if there was a minimal use situation? You would think you could do something easier in that case. So if you use the dwelling unit as a home and you rent it less than 15 days during the year, that period isn't treated as rental activity. See use as a home, but rented less than 15 days later for more information. So the IRS is saying maybe if it was less than the 15 days, maybe it's not worth doing the whole rental thing the irs is probably thinking that if it was only rented for 15 days it's likely that you're probably going to have expenses greater to the income of the rental property which would result in them not getting any money because you would report a zero or a loss and obviously again the irs doesn't want you to report losses anyways so you might have this minimal rental usage therefore when you have this vacation home situation it can be quite confusing for taxes. You have to be careful with related parties, how much you're gonna use it as a vacation home. What about these exchange type of situations and so on and so forth and be careful of the brother messing up your whole tax situation. So limit on deductions. So renting a dwelling unit that is considered a home isn't a passive activity. Instead, if your rental expenses are more than your rental income, some or all of the excess expenses can't be used to offset income from other sources. So now we have this rule, is it going to be a home? If it's a home, what's the big deal? What, what's going to be the problem with that? Well, then you might not be able to take some of the losses, which could be a problem because again, a lot of times the rental property might be running at losses and you know you would like to be able to take those if it would be possible so once again renting a dwelling unit that is considered a home isn't a passive activity instead if your rental expenses are more than your rental income some or all of the excess expenses can't be used to offset income from other sources so the excess expenses that can't be used uh, that can't be used to offset income from other sources are carried forward to the next year and treated as rental expenses for the same property. So notice if it's passive activity and we have losses, usually the passive activities are kind of like in their own lane. So I can't maybe take the passive activity against other income, although there's that $25,000 rule for rental property if your adjusted gross income is below a threshold and you actively participate but at least I can take it against other property that might be passive typically. Here we're getting more restrictive and saying now it's got to be in, we, we might be able to take the, the, the loss, but it would have to be applied to not only just passive income, but to that particular property possibly. So again, much more restrictive. So any expenses carried forward to the next year will be subject to any limits that apply for that year. This limitation will apply to excess carry forward to another year, even if you don't use the property as your home for that subsequent year. So you might say, so now it's been restricted in this way because you used it as a home. What if next year it's not qualified as used as a home because you didn't hang out in it that year 
and it didn't qualify as a home, does it change the ability to then take the deduction that flowed forward? Well, you would think the IRS would say, no, you know, we're still going to keep it as something that you have to take against basically that property's income would be you know, what you would think they would probably do in that case. So once again, any expenses carried forward to the next year will be subject to any limits that apply for that year. This limitation will apply to excess uh, carried forward to another year, even if you don't use the property as your main home for that subsequent year. So to figure your deductible rental expenses for this year and any carryover next year, use worksheet 5-1. Obviously software can help us with these carry forward type of situations. So we wanna make sure that we do the data input properly into the system so that it will properly be able to calculate whether it's a home or not, applying the appropriate restrictions, rather that be the at-risk limitations or the passive activity rules, or now this rule, if it is a home that's gonna take place if there is a loss, then if you use the same software from year to year, it will hopefully help you properly carry over the possible deductions into future years and hopefully keep them all in the proper lane so that it'll help you do your calculations. So reporting income and deductions. So property not used for personal purposes. So if you don't use a dwelling unit for personal purposes, see chapter three we've discussed before for how to report your rental income and expenses. Property used for personal purposes. If you do use a dwelling unit for personal purposes, then uh, how you report your rental income and expenses depends on whether you use the dwelling unit as a home. So not used as a home. What if it's not used as a home. So we've talked about this qualification as to whether it's going to be a home or not, and that's going to impact how we treat it. What if it's not used as a home? So if you use a dwelling unit for personal purposes, but not as a home, report all the rental income, report all the rental income in your income. Because you use the personal dwelling unit for personal purposes, you must divide your expenses between the rental use and the personal use as described earlier in this chapter under dividing expenses. So we still have to divide the expenses up, but you would think that you would be able to deduct the expenses related to the rental part of the home. So the expenses for personal use aren't deductible as rental expenses. So obviously the personal side isn't deductible. Your deductible rental expenses uh, can be more than your gross rental income, which again, often the case for rental property, we have a loss situation. That can happen if it's not categorized, uh, not used as a home. So do, 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 however, you, you still have the income limitations that we discussed prior, which include the, you know, the, the, a lot of it, if you had a huge, a big loss limitation, we had the at risk limitations and then the passive income limitations could apply in that situation where you might have an active participation where you still might be able to deduct up to 25,000 if your AGI is below a certain limit. All right. What if it is used as a home, but rented less than 15 days? So now you're under that 15 day threshold. So if you used a dwelling unit as a home and you rent it less than 15 days during the year, its primary function isn't considered to be rental and it shouldn't be reported on the Schedule E. So that's the kind of de minimis kind of thing. It's under the bracket. IRS is saying it's less than 15 days. We're basically gonna call it personal. We don't want you even to report it on the Schedule E because it's likely you're gonna try to apply expenses that are at least going to match the income or be greater than the income. And the IRS, again, is skeptical of losses and is unlikely to be picking up income if you only rented it possibly for 15 days, right? I think that's kind of the rationale from the IRS's side of things. So just don't bother, call it personal, right, is the idea. So you're, 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 you aren't required to report the rental income and rental expenses from this activity. Notice how they frame it. You're not required to, obviously, in that case, it's more likely that you would like to because you're probably going to have expenses greater than the income resulting in a loss that you're going to try to take against other things. And the IRS is basically saying, no, just don't even do anything. And then any expenses related to the home, such as mortgage interest, property taxes, and any qualified casualty loss will rep be reported normally allowed on the Schedule A. So now if it's your second home, you might still get the personal side of things which is the mortgage interest possibly on the Schedule A, 
property taxes if you're over the threshold to itemize versus standardizing, which is probably the case if you have, say, uh, a second home, but all the other expenses that you might be able to get if it were rental property like depreciation, repairs, and whatnot, uh, you're typically not going to get because those are the ones that would be reported on the Schedule E. So see the instructions for Schedule A for more information on deducting these expenses. Used as a home and rented 15 days or more. So now it qualifies that you used it as a home, but you also rented it for more than 15 days. So or 15 or more. So if you use the dwelling unit as a home and rent it 15 days or more during the year, include all your rental income and your income. So again, the IRS is now saying the income is high enough that it might be higher than the expenses. And obviously, if you have income, we want a piece of it as your silent partner. So because you use the dwelling unit for personal purposes, you must divide your expenses between the rental use and the personal use as described earlier in the chapter under dividing expenses. So from our side, we want the deductions, which are the expenses, but we only can break them out between personal and business or rental and only use the rental expenses. The expenses for personal use aren't deductible as rental expenses, possibly some of you, that's the idea. So if you, if you had, a net profit from renting the dwelling unit for the year. That is if your rental income is more than the total of your rental expenses, including depreciation, deduct all your rental expenses. So in other words, obviously if you had rental income, fine, great. IRS is gonna take part of it, no problem. It's when there's a loss, that's when the IRS is say, hold up, hold up, something ain't right here. So you, so you don't, you, so in that case, you wouldn't need to use the worksheet, however, if you had a net loss from renting the dwelling unit for the year, your deduction for, the, for certain rental expenses is, is limited. So now you've got more limitations because it's qualified as a home. Remember the prior limitations are, you would have been if it was passive income, it has to be in the passive income lane. If you're actively participating, you might be able to deduct up to 25,000 if you're actively participating, but it's more restrictive here because it's considered a home and therefore they could limit the amount of losses and then apply that to a very strict lane, not just mapping it or tying out against other passive income, but to income from that particular property, possibly carrying it forward to income from that particular property. So to figure your deductible rent expenses in any carry forward to next year, you can use worksheet five one, which I won't go into detail here. You can look at that in the publication. And obviously you can run, we might run scenarios in a tax software to get an idea of these different uh, situations and look at the worksheet in essence generated through software. In that case, clearly if you're dealing with rental property, especially with all these different types of situations with personal use and whether it's qualifies as a home or so on, yet yeah, you're going to want to use software typically.